on test and right. So I'm just keeping this simple and I kept it straight. I know it's not actually straight in your body. And so this is, let's say that you have some damage here, okay, and then it stops a little bit and then damage goes here and then all of a sudden, okay, it, and then damage comes up here. It can just be random. But basically, the damage in Crohn's disease is never continuous. Notice that this area is healthy, this area is healthy, but these areas underlined are all damaged from Crohn's disease. And that's, um, that's a feature of Crohn's disease that is not present in ulcerative colitis. It's what's called skip lesions. So the damage that you'll see from Crohn's disease, it can skip throughout the entire GI tract. Crohn's disease can happen anywhere from your mouth going all the way down into the stomach, into the small intestine, through the large intestine. It can happen anywhere in the GI tract, anywhere. But the difference is that, like I said, it, is, it skips around, it has skip lesions, okay? But its most common spot to affect is at the terminal ileum. And remember, the terminal ileum is just the final segment of the small intestine. So the sections of the small intestine are the duodenum, the jejunum, and then the ileum. So the terminal ileum is the most common part to be affected, but it can actually affect anywhere. Okay, so that's just a general kind of kind of as far as location of damage. Another thing that's important about Crohn's disease is this damage is transmural. It's what's called transmural uh, granulomatous. Let's say transmural granulomatous. So that gives you two things about it. First of all, I told you in ulcerative colitis that when you look at the damage, this is the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis mucosa, and then the serosa. I said that the damage will stop at the submucosa. So you would have ulceration through all of this, and then it just stops, and it never goes deeper than that. It always stays in this location. Now, in Crohn's disease, the damage actually goes through the entire wall wherever the damage takes place, so if this is our wall right here, and we have, you know, all of those layers that I read out, written out, the damage is through the entire wall, okay? The entire, all of the walls. Although it won't be continuous damage, so you, this may, this area may be healthy, but wherever the damage decides to be, the damage is through the entire wall. And that's going to have a lot of side effects with it that weren't present in uh, Crohn's disease. So this is described as knife-like 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 okay so basically what that means is that imagine that somebody took a knife and stabbed you know somebody let's say in the arm or in the stomach or whatever that knife would basically look like this it would go all the way through all the layers and then it would be back to normal right so this is what's called a knife-like presentation when you look at it on histology okay now, because I said that the primary location of Crohn's disease is in the terminal ileum, let's think back, let's look back down here as far as anatomy is concerned. I said that in ulcerative colitis, it always starts at the rectum and then it can go up through the bowel, but really it can stop anywhere along there. So all of the primary damage is in the left lower quadrant. Now, when we're referring to Crohn's disease, I said that the primary location in Crohn's disease is going to be right here, which is the terminal ileum the terminal ileum. That's part of the small intestine. Although it can affect anywhere, this is the most common location. And look as far as if you would split this in half and then the, the, you know, the four sections, look where the damage is now. Now the damage is focused in the right lower quadrant. So that's kind of a little thing that you can use to kind of get a general idea of what you may be dealing with. Right lower quadrant pain is more in line with Crohn's disease. Okay. Another thing that's important, this is a picture looking inside the patient's uh, um, intestines, and this is showing what's called cobblestone lesions. So they've received this knife-like transmural inflammation that's kind of like this, and whatever area is infected goes all the way down through the four layers, and then this, this bubbling up basically that's, is, is just all scar tissue because it's trying to scar up and fill in this entire area. The whole thing's been damaged, and there's so much damage that it puffs up a little bit on the surface. Okay, so you have the fibroblasts that are the myelofibroblasts and the fibroblasts, and they're trying to put in that scar tissue and uh, collagen and whatnot. So you get these little bubbles, and that's right here in this picture, and that's called cobblestone mucosa. So when you look, if they show you a picture like this, this is for Crohn's disease. How do I remember that? The way I remember that is because if you look at the C in Crohn's disease, it's for me it stands for cobblestone. 
And that also helps you if you're trying to remember, well, which one is the one that has skip lesions present? You know, the one where the damage can happen and then stop and then happen again somewhere else. Well, think of, you never, you like, you ever stood out at a river and you were throwing rocks and you took like a really, one of those really flat rocks and you threw it out onto the water out here and it would skip. Certain rocks have the potential to skip. So I, when I think of cobblestone, I think of those skipping stones and I think of skip lesions. So that's two little tricks to help you remember the important parts of this disease. Okay, another really important point. Because I told you that the primary damage is at the terminal ileum, do you remember what is normally absorbed at the terminal ileum? It's those bile salts and those bile fats and whatnot and all that. So if these things are not absorbed, what you're going to end up presenting with is, so a little, just a little side note, bile salts combine they combine with oxalate, okay, oxalate. And basically, when they combine with oxalate, they're retained in the body, and this buildup of bile salts, with, bile salts with oxalate can form calcium oxalate stones in the kidney, calcium oxalate stones, because now we're not absorbing all the bile salts, and it's being retained then uh, there in the bile, and then it's basically combining now it's combining with the oxalate and we can no longer get rid of it because it's combining with the oxalate. So this is forming what's called the calcium oxalate stones. And this will cause a calcium oxalate nephrolithiasis. This is going to cause basically kidney stones, um, calcium oxalate stones. Okay. On top of that, if the damage is primarily at the terminal ileum, keep in mind that vitamin B12 is absorbed. Vitamin B12 is absorbed here. Not only that, remember I said that Crohn's disease, although this is the most common spot in the terminal ileum, it can happen anywhere in the body, including other areas of the small intestine. If it were to be affecting the duodenum, which is the most, basically that is the place where the most stuff is absorbed, you can have all sorts of malnutrition. So if they present with the patient with all sorts of like vitamin deficiencies and missing different things in their diet, even though they're eating it, but they're like really malnourished, then you need to be thinking more of Crohn's disease if they set up a situation of inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. And then the last thing, uh, I think this is the last point. Let me make sure. Oh yeah. I know it's a really important point. Well, let's go back to knife lesions. I told you that these knife lesions go down and they go through the entire four areas of the uh, luminal wall, right? Well, I want you to keep in mind when you're looking at a picture, uh, large intestine and the small intestines are all in here. And then look right here at the lower part of the body, the bladder's right here, okay? A way that test takers will like to kind of put, like uh, as far as like in uh, QBank or whatever, they'll basically say that the patient is presenting with brown colored like uh, urine. And what that's getting at is that this, these small intestine and large intestine, all that, basically a part of the small intestine can open up because, because the damage to the bowel wall is through the entire segment of the wall. That means literally there is no wall left. So if you damage this entire, if you damage this entire thing, there's just an opening right here. And that means that everything that's in the intestine can exit out and it can begin to damage other things around it. Well, one of the things it could be close to is the bladder. And it can damage through the bladder, form an opening, and now there's a connection between the intestine and the bladder. That's going to then send, it can send fecal matter, it can send all sorts of other stuff within the bladder, and then you will urinate that out. And the common presentation is that fecal matter gets into the bladder and you're basically peeing out feces along with um, your urine. And so that's what's called a fistula. Okay, just that's the general term. Fistula stands for an abnormal connection between two, let's say, tubes of the body or two section, uh, air little areas of, of the body. And fistulas happen only in Crohn's disease, not in ulcerative colitis. Remember, the reason is because Crohn's disease, it goes through all four layers of the uh, wall, so it literally can rip through the entire thing. Okay, so that's in Crohn's disease. Another important thing, I told you earlier that Crohn's disease is a transmural granulomatous. That just means inflammation. So that just means that granuloma, remember what a granuloma is. A granuloma is when you have the epithelioid histiocytes, which is a type of macrophage, and you have those, um, you have a bunch of those macrophages that are basically encompassing 
the where the inflammation is. So say this is whatever for whatever reason this is an inflamed section, okay? And then these epitheliohistiocytes will will aid in forming a granuloma to box in that inflammation. So you will find non-caseating granulomas. Non-caseating granulomas. Non-caseating just means that you don't see necrosis with on the inside. Everything on the inside is still alive. But, there's, but it's still a granuloma present, okay? Non-caseating granulomas. That's present in Crohn's disease. And then the last point I want to talk about is, well, actually, I'm going to talk two more points. We're going to look at uh, kind of, I'm going to draw out, because I couldn't find a good picture, but I want to draw out what, what else can happen. I told you that you can have a fistula. And I said that because the entire wall is eaten through, you can have abnormal connections with whatever that intestine is near, right? Well, also, what else can happen is, let's say that this, I'm going to draw out the, the layers again. So this was the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis mucosa, and the serosa. Because all four of those layers are damaged, what you end up having is the underlying fat, so the subcutaneous tissue that's surrounding the intestines in the interstitium of the abdomen, the fat, all of this fat, can then seep into these areas that are damaged and you can have fat that sneaks into the serosa and the muscularis mucosa layers or wherever. So you'll see fat that has begun to go into the wall of the, of a, of the lumen, the luminal wall of a Crohn's disease patient in their intestines. This is called creeping fat. So if they give you a gross image and you see all this like whitish yellow, this like yellowish color white fat stuff that's going into the wall or is like really close to kind of penetrating into the wall. This is kind of uh, hinting you towards um, Crohn's disease. Another thing that you can get is if we had our wall again, this is our wall, and I said that it, go, it can go through the entire wall. What you can get, because it goes through the whole wall and because I said that this fibrosis to try to heal this injury can go up and it basically goes real far even above it, right? You can get... Be, so let's say the same thing's happening on the other side as well. So we, you know, it went. We had the damage deep into this. Here's all our damage in here, and then you know the fibroblasts come and try to fill all that in. What you're getting here is you're narrowing the lumen because it's popping out so much. Whereas an ulcerative colitis, the damage wasn't as severe; it didn't go as deep. You're getting what's called a stricture. So when you look at the intestine, you'll see something like this. There'll be a little area where it's real narrow and it's hard for things to get through. So what happens is this part, the area proximal to the stricture will get really big and it will swell up. And then this area over here, it basically will get a little bit more narrow because there's nothing in it. Okay, so it's like there's an occlusion right there and that's called a stricture. And what that'll look like on an x-ray, it'll look way more severe than this on an x-ray. On an x-ray, which I, like I said, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a good picture that I was able to use. It's called a string sign on an x-ray. So you have, you know, all of a sudden you have bowel, you know, and then you get to an area where there's a stricture. And you'll be able to see that on an x-ray because out of nowhere, sorry about that, out of nowhere, you're going to see all of a sudden it's as thin as a string. And then it goes back to, again, normal bowel. This is called a string sign. And that's because there's nothing, nothing can get through this area that has been strictured at this point. That's because Crohn's disease has had transmural inflammation that has gone through all four layers of it on both sides. And it has strictured it down so much to where things can barely get through here. And then you would see a little bit of dilation right here on this side at the proximal side on x-ray. Okay, so... And then the last thing, smoking. Remember I said in ulcerative colitis, smoking helps to protect against it. But a simple reason why smoking would not help protect against an ulcerative uh, Crohn's disease patient is because you have it a complete destruction of all four layers of the, um, the luminal wall here. So in Crohn's disease, you can imagine that carcinogens and whatnot, it's not just that, okay, smoking increases mucus production. Because, yeah, that would help a little bit, but the problem is when the smoking carcinogens are entering, going and through, are going all over through your blood system, and they're going through the lumen of, your, of, of the intestines, because all of the damages, the layers are damaged, it can get all the way through and cause a lot sort of problems and even worse inflammation. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, it had to stop right at the end of the uh, submucosa, and it couldn't reach into the muscularis mucosae or the uh, serosa. So because these carcinogens of smoking can get down and irritate deep into these uh, knife-like um, 
inflammatory sections, that is what makes the problem a lot worse. And then you have even more inflammation and even more damage from the Crohn's disease. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Um, but I think I've covered all the, the kind of the major points of what to know. I hope I've made this kind of simple to understand. Um, I'd imagine that if you're visiting this video, you probably knew all of the symptoms. You had gone over them before, but you were trying to find a clever way to keep all of them straight. And I hope the explanations on this video made sense. If they helped you in any sort of way, please don't forget to subscribe, like the video, comment what you think I did well and what I didn't do well, and I will try to fix any problems that I didn't clear up very well um, with an added comment that I can pin at the bottom and help to explain something further to you. Um, I will see you in another video. Bye.